Good afternoon. We begin a new series of programs in Mediascope with collaboration of Istanbul Policy Center, Sabancı University, and Stiftung Mercato Initiative. Uh, we will focus on uh, this series of programs on the position of Turkey in international order and in European order in particular. So today we have two guests, um, Professor Senem Aydın Düzgit and Professor Frank Schmelfenig. Thank you very much for, your, um, join, for joining us today. And we, uh, we talk about today differ differentiated integration and EU-Turkey relations. But first, um, uh, before we, uh, we discuss on, the, on um, differentiated integration and EU-Turkey relations, um, Professor Duzgit, uh, could you please explain um, what um, this in initiative is and what kind of events, programs, scholarships does it organize and so on? Okay. Um, well, let me first say a few things about the Istanbul Policy Center, of course, for those who might not be familiar with the institution. Uh, the Istanbul Policy Center is a part of Sabancı University uh, that works more on policy-oriented research, uh, focusing on certain thematic areas, uh, including but not limited to conflict resolution, Turkish foreign policy, Turkey's relations with the European Union and Europe in particular, um, and climate change, urbanization are some of the topics that, that we deal with. And an important part of IPC work is in in uh, conjunction with the Mercator Foundation um, in Germany, in Essen, mm -hmm. uh, where we have the IPC Mercator Initiative. This is an initi initiative that has been in place uh, for more than seven years now. Um, and under the initiative, we fund, uh, the initiative funds various research projects in these different research clusters that I've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you have conflict, you have climate change, you have urbanization, you have foreign policy. Uh, and within and under the umbrella of the initiative, we also have IPC Mercator Fellowship Program where we have a fellowship program for junior uh, fellows uh, who are mostly you know, uh, people who have just completed their PhD or young scholars or researchers, but they don't necessarily have to be academics or postdocs. Uh, sometimes journalists or artists, etc., are also funded within the scheme depending on their project, uh, which lasts for one year. So every year we recruit uh, IPC Mercat or fellows working in uh, one of those thematic areas. But we also have the IPC Mercator Senior uh, Fellowship Initiative, uh, and which we're very happy to have Professor Frank Schimmelfenning uh, from um, ETH Zurich with us as a part of the Senior Fellowship Program, uh, where we have senior and distinguished fellows uh, from Europe, but also from the United States, um, to come and spend a certain amount of time uh, at the IPC um, doing their research or attending their meetings and talking about their um, current projects or research interests, etc., to the uh, crowd, to the academics, policymakers, think tank community, etc., within uh, Turkey. And uh, that's more or less how we function. Okay. <laughs> By the way, I forgot to introduce my guests. I'm so sorry. Senem Aydın Düzgit is a senior scholar and research and academic affairs coordinator at the Istanbul Policy Center and also professor of international relations at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences uh, of Sabancı University. And uh, Professor Frank Schmelfenich is currently a Mercator IPC uh, visiting senior fellow uh, and professor of European politics uh, and a member of the Center for Comparative and International Studies at Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And now... Um, uh, we can. I, I would like to begin with the hottest topic, actually, uh, which is called Brexit. So, um, after Brexit, you, uh, how do you see the future of the European Union? Um, such a failure or a continuing story? Well, I mean, the fact that uh, Brexit happened is, of course, a failure. It's uh, the major. Uh, probably even the only instance of disintegration in the European Union that has happened so, so far. So it is a turning point in the history of European integration because the assumption was that European integration only knows one direction, yeah, which is forward, upward. Yeah? And Brexit reminds us that 
history has different directions, and so it is uh, really a, a turning point in that development. It is, however, not uh, the first step towards the disintegration of the European Union. Mm -hmm. I think it is a, a singular event to some extent. Um, we do not see any other member states uh, following the uh, United Kingdom out of the um, European Union. And, of course, uh, if history can be re re reversed, it means, um, well, maybe a generation from now, yeah, mm -hmm. a different U United Kingdom might want to apply to join again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same question is also for you, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Dusgit. Uh, do you agree with? Uh, yes, Schimmel yes, I largely agree with uh, Professor Schimmelfenning. I, uh, I think it's important that uh, it hasn't been followed, or basically it hasn't been taken as a precedence for the other states, for the other member states. And furthermore, I think the whole process, which was very prolonged and which was very crisis-ridden, um, in fact, in my opinion, uh, serves as a kind of a disincentive for any country that has watched that happen and then has watched and seen that torturous process unfold. And I don't think they would be very willing uh, for the same process to happen to them. It has been very polarizing. It has been very problematic. It has been dragged on. And I think it demonstrated as well that it's very difficult for you to negotiate as a single country against the whole European Union. So in terms of you know showing the dynamics of the process as well, it is perhaps even uh, a discouraging element uh, for the uh, for the other countries to follow suit. Mm -hmm. uh, considering Turkey, um, uh, what could you say? Um, the, it, is it a positive or negative thing, Brexit, I mean, for Turkey? Mm. Well, both. Okay. <laughs> In the sense that, uh, well, I mean, Negative that I wouldn't say it negative, but difficult in the sense that now Turkey has to, and, and Britain of course, has to uh, formulate its own policies uh, with Turkey, uh, be it in trade or, or other matters that was subject to the EU uh, policy framework so far. So for Turkey, of course, that is also a challenge, considering the fact it also has a customs union agreement with the EU, etc. So that's the challenge. I wouldn't say negative, but a challenge to deal with. Um, but a negative in the sense that, I mean, Britain was an EU member state that was always, I mean, often in favor of EU's enlargement to Turkey. I mean, even though recently enlargement is mostly off the agenda, it was still uh, much more favorable towards, uh, you know, EU's relationship with Turkey and its wider neighborhood. So in a way, it has lost that kind of heavyweight in the European Union that has played an important role in the past in pushing uh, for Turkey's accession negotiations. So that can be taken as perhaps a negative. Uh, mm -hmm. negative development. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now we can talk about the main main topic uh, of this program, differentiated integration. You uh, have a book which will be published in February, I think, with Thomas Winson, uh, uh, which has titled uh, Ever Loser Union, Differentiated European Integration. Actually, what is differentiated integration? Can you elaborate this? Yes, of course. Uh, well, it's probably good to start with the opposite, which is uniform integration. And that means uh, all member states and member states only are integrated to the same de degree in the same way as every other member state. Yeah? Uh, so differentiated integration means that there are, uh, there's variation in the depth of integration of individual countries. And that applies both to member states. Yeah. So not all member states integrate to the same extent in all policy areas uh, as the other member states. But it can also mean non-member states selectively participate in EU policies mm -hmm. uh, without becoming uh, an institutional member of the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, but in perception, uh, this, um, this concept could be... Up, it's, my point of view, it could be uh, perceived uh, as an insulting thing because the, uh, the candidate countries like Turkey, for example, uh, thinks that it uh, has to be a full member of the European Union. The other option or options are something something um, lower or, or insulting or something like that. Yeah, I mean, th this, this could be one perception and I think differentiated integration is, 
is open to uh, various uh, 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 meanings and usages. Um, so let, let, me, let me make two points here. One is there are, of course, states that see differentiated integration as an opportunity and as a, as a chance. Mm -hmm. yeah? So um, imagine a European Union which only had two options. Yeah? Either you're a full member mm -hmm. or you're not a member at all. What that would mean is that, okay, if you want to join European integration, be a member, you have to subscribe to everything, even if you don't like it. Yeah? So, I mean, from, from the point of view of, of Denmark or the uh, UK in the past, having differentiated integration was, was actually something they liked yeah? because it offered them a, a choice. Yeah? And uh, it also uh, gives um, the member states or states in Europe in general, the opportunity to choose from the menu of integration the degree of integration that they, that they like and that their people want. Mm -hmm. Now, of, of course, for uh, those, uh, and these are those countries that actually uh, would like to have less European integration than the majority of the member states. Of course, you're referring to those countries that would like full integration but are blocked from full integration uh, by, the, by the European Union. But even for these countries, I think differentiated integration is an, is an opportunity because it offers them a range of partial integration uh, in a situation where the uh, alternative would be no integration at all. So that would mean Turkey without a customs union mm -hmm. and a number of other cooperation agreements that it might have with the European Union. Mm. What kind of uh, uh, what are the types of the um, differentiated integration in your book? You mention uh, instrumental differentiation, constitutional differentiation, and uh, so on. So, um, can you? Yeah. So, I mean, we've already talked about this external and yeah. internal uh, mm. differentiation: member states, non-member states. You also have different types or modes of differentiated integration. So, there's the the famous. Uh, uh, multiple speed integration, which means that some countries move ahead, others follow. There's also the idea of a core Europe, where you have a, a group of member states that is fully integrated, and you have other states that um, do not wish to or are blocked from being fully integrated, which are a, a bit of the con concentric circles around this core. And there's also the idea, well, you have different Europes, yeah, and countries part participate in these different Europes, let's say a, an economic Europe, a defense Europe, yeah, uh, uh, to, uh, partic um, to varying extents. So, I mean, uh, th the meaning is actually quite open. What now you refer to when you speak about instrumental and uh, uh, constitutional uh, differentiation is uh, two logics of differentiated integration that have uh, driven differentiation in the European Union uh, for the past decades. Um, so when we speak about instrumental differentiation, what we mean is mainly the uh, differentiation of new member states. So when new member states enter the European Union, it is rare that they become full members from day one of their membership. Yeah? But there are some exemptions, there are some uh, transitional arrangements, so they do not fully participate mm -hmm. in all European policies from, from day one. But this is, this is as, as I said, a, a transitory stage. Yeah? So after a few years, they usually become full members if they, if they want to. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the uh, constitutional differentiation, this is about, uh, this is really about what kind of European constitution you want. Yeah? Do you want the European Union to be a, uh, a deep internal market, yeah? or do you want the European Union to also move into areas of core state powers like um, uh, fiscal policy, welfare state policies, internal and external security policies, uh, this has been a major divide among the member states and has been one, one driver of mm -hmm. differentiation among the member states. Mm -hmm. Professor Duzgit, uh, how do you find this new approach? Can I say new approach? Well, it's been around for, for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, what do you think about this uh, differentiated uh, integration? Yeah, let me start by referring to your question mm -hmm. about 
you know, because you, what you were referring to was whether this this can be read as some kind of privileged partnership, mm -hmm. which has always been taken as a bit mm -hmm. of an insult mm -hmm. to injury mm -hmm. <laughs> in the Turkish psyche. And uh, I, I, I think it's important to clarify that these two things are not the same thing. Mm? Mm -hmm. What is understood as privileged partnership in the Turkish context is something, a mode of relationship that is offered by the EU uh, instead of membership, where Turkey has the minimal amount of voice, basically, in that relationship. And I think when people think of it as such, it sort of, it reinforces their feeling of inequality and this feeling of, you know, being dominated by Europe, etc. But differentiated integration as, is not exactly the same thing as privileged partnership. I think conceptually we need to distinguish between the two because in differentiated integration in a way is a, ma is a mode of being mm, mm -hmm. for Europe right now. It's this kind of an ontological mm -hmm. issue in terms of how EU shapes itself inside, both inside and outside. So it's not like a specific policy that is imposed on specific states. It's the mode of being that results uh, as, a, as, as a result of an interaction between the European Union and within its member states, but also between the European Union and different countries in its wider neighborhood, in the north and the south and the east. Huh? So those two things are different. And when you take it as such, uh, then you know the next point to make, and a related point to make, is that uh, a membership and differentiated integration are not mutually exclusive phenomena, right? If if I'm not mistaken, so uh, you can have the membership option there and still be engaged with EU in various different institutional arrangements and cooperation or customs union or what have you, uh, and, and, and be a part of that differentiated integration model. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that way, it doesn't cancel out, it doesn't rule out uh, indefinitely the membership perspective uh, for any country that can be, in principle, considered European. Mm -hmm. it, I think it, it was really important to emphasize uh, the difference between privileged partnership and uh, differentiated integration because uh, uh, I also thought uh, in the beginning what's the difference between differentiated integration and uh, privileged partnership and thank you very much <laughs> for this and um, I would like to uh, and talk. sorry let me just say something as yeah, well yeah, sorry yeah, yeah, yeah. Of and uh, and and another thing is that, mm -hmm. in, again, I mean, since, no, mm -hmm. since I'm familiar with the Turkish context mm -hmm. as well, privileged partnership has a very sort of negative connotation because mm -hmm. it is seen as a specific policy that is only designed with Turkey, whereas differentiated integration covers all the countries in the EU's wider neighborhood. So it's mm -hmm. geographically is a very wide region. So once you're a part of that differentiated network, mm -hmm. you're just one country among many others who are associated with the EU mm -hmm. under different contractual arrangements. I think that also distinguishes it from what we perceive as privileged mm -hmm. partnership in the Turkish mind. Mm -hmm. Another issue, um, what is the problem uh, in enlargement of the EU to the Balkan countries, the, uh, this contradiction between France and Germany, or France and the rest of Europe, mm -hmm. I don't know. And, um, what, what is the problem? and? Uh, how can differentiated integration work in this case? Well, so here we are uh, really in the context of, of enlargement, yeah? which is, I mean, as uh, uh, Senem said, uh, something we should distinguish from the differentiated integration. So what's the problem? Um, so e EU enlargement since the uh, early 1990s has been has been based on some kind of a, of a deal. Yeah? So uh, the EU tells European non-member countries, uh, you reform, you become democratic, you become rule of law states, you uh, uh, modernize your economies, you modernize your administrations, you improve governance, yeah? that covers everything. In return, yeah, the more you improve governance, the closer you get to membership. Yeah? And, um, differentiated inter integration in this context means, okay, um, there are different steps towards membership. Yeah? So we, we might start with a um, trade agreement or partnership and cooperation agreement, then comes an association agreement. Uh, this can be upgraded, yeah? then you become a candidate for membership, then you start negotiations. And, and the deal always has been, okay, the more you um, approach, yeah, the standard of governance that the European Union sets, the closer you move towards uh, this um, um, 
uh, towards the, the full membership stage. And everything in, in between is differentiated into creation. So, you, so countries in the enlargement process are already able to participate in some policies, yeah, get some rights um, with regard to the European Union, but not the full uh, set of membership rights. Now, the, the difficulty in the, in, the Balkan, in, in the Western Balkans, um, but I don't think this is just a Western Balkans issue, yeah, mm -hmm. is that uh, this, this deal has uh, become shaky yeah, and has suffered from... Um, let's say, from lack of certainty on both sides. Mm -hmm. So from the EU side, the EU perceives the Western Balkan countries to, uh, to relent, to stall in their uh, democratization process. We've seen some democratic backsliding in the Western Balkans. Um, we've seen uh, uh, setbacks to rule of law reforms in these, in these countries. On the other hand, We've seen negative public opinion in the European Union on Western Balkans enlargement. We've seen uh, uh, some member states uh, dragging their feet, yeah, uh, undermining their commitment to the uh, uh, European Union. And, and I think to some extent both processes feed on each other yeah? because you only reform if you think that this will lead to membership, whereas the EU will only give membership if it is confident yeah, that these countries... Uh, um, institutionalize these reforms and also the um, uh, ex experience yeah, mm -hmm. of Bulgaria and, and Romania where the EU thought after they joined, well, they weren't really ready yet or we, we see the uh, uh, problems in many Central and Eastern European countries now. Mm -hmm. um, both processes interact and basically undermine each other. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is the basic issue. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the French-German uh, difference here is that um, uh, France has taken the point of view, well, we need to reform this entire process because it's not working. Mm -hmm. and, um, we need to uh, find a new enlargement strategy. Um, well, whether this is sincere or not is a matter of, de of, of debate. It also has to do with, let's say, a long-standing reluctance of France uh, mm -hmm. towards Eastern enlargement, which we've al already seen in, in the 1990s. Whereas for Germany, um, the uh, I I idea is, well, it's a gradual process, uh, and uh, even if the countries don't meet all the conditions now, it's still good to... Um, um, give them the uh, chance to move them ahead in this, in, in this process. And, of course, the concrete issue was North Mac Macedonia, where uh, 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 Northern Macedonia, after a uh, period of democratic backsliding, yeah, went back to liberal reform, also solved the name issue with Greece yeah, by moving from mm -hmm. uh, the Republic of Macedonia to Northern Mac Macedonia. Um, most of the EU member states thought, okay, this needs to be rewarded yeah, uh, because it sends a bad signal if you put conditions, countries meet the conditions, and then still uh, they do not advance uh, towards membership. So um, most of the, members, of the members thought that this should be rewarded by the, by the start of, a, of accession negotiations, whereas uh, France and a few other countries uh, blocked this. But, uh, but I think uh, this is... This is, let's say, the, the front line, mm -hmm. the observable front line, but there are structural issues in this enlargement uh, process that, let's say, neither the German nor the, nor the French position can, can solve, yeah, which is the, the um, uh, reduction of, uh, let's say, um, uh, confidence um, in this uh, entire process and the reduction in confidence in the quid pro quo. Yeah? You reform, we admit you. Mm -hmm. um, the time is running, so uh, let's talk about Turkey. Um, okay. Is it all over in, in terms of EU-Turkey uh, relations? Or what are the major problems? Well, I mean, it can never be all over, even if both sides want mm -hmm. it to be all over. The, there are major issues which tie the two sides together which means that there will always be uh, some kind of contractual relationship and Turkey will be you know, a part of that differentiated integration zone one way or another. 
If you look at the European Union, it's the number one trading partner of Turkey, of course, so there is an economic issue. EU member states are the number one foreign direct investment providers in Turkey. Uh, and plus, of course, there's a migration issue which connects the two. There's the fight against terrorism, etc., etc. So there are various key issue areas in which both sides have to look eye to eye. Uh, so that is why, even if they do want it to be over, it's very difficult for them not to. But on the other hand, the enlargement question is a different question. And of course, enlargement side, things seem to be frozen for the time being. Of course, on paper, contractually speaking, Turkey is still an accession country, a candidate country that's conducting accession negotiations with the EU. But we know that accession negotiations are currently at a stalemate, so there are no chapters opened, no chapters can be closed anyway. So there's a dead end that's been reached there. Dead end? Okay, yes, my, for now. <coughs> so my, impre my impression is uh, um, you are, a, not a little bit, but... Uh, Pessimistic. Well, I mean, in terms of membership in the short to medium term, my personal hunch is that mm -hmm. is a pessimistic one, of course. And that's not just because of the way in which today's Turkey is governed and its mm -hmm. governance problems are, of course, mounting. That's another story. Mm -hmm. But also the fact that, as Frank has rightly discussed, that there is an also a very negative mood in the European Union regarding enlargement. Mm -hmm. And even towards Western Balkans, or when you put Turkey in the picture, of course, I guess the negative mood would be even more compounded. Uh, so uh, when you, you know, put the two together, uh, I don't think there are grounds to be very optimistic optimistic in the foreseeable future in terms of membership. But again, that doesn't mean that both sides you know, cannot uh, find workable ways of dealing with one another. Mm -hmm. How do you see the future of the um, Turkish, uh, EU-Turkey relations? Yeah, well, I think uh, uh, Senem um, dis dis described the current situation mm -hmm. correctly. I think in the foreseeable future, in enlargement is not mm -hmm. the way to go, and that has to do with uh, the situation on both sides. Um, so, but geography doesn't go away, interdependence doesn't go away, uh, so we have to think creatively about al alternative options. And here, differentiated integration comes, comes in, in again. Yeah? So um, uh, I think both uh, sides have uh, a lot of um, common interests, or at least common problems, yeah? and um, these are best dealt with yeah, in, a, in a cooperative uh, manner. And uh, you, can, you can basically go through the entire list of policy issues, and you will always find, okay, there's something that the EU and Turkey need to talk about. Now, uh, one of the uh, problems here is that um, this mutual cooperation is so much fraught with the membership issue yeah, mm -hmm. that I see the danger that a fruitful cooperation does not happen yeah, because the membership question always gets in the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So from the, from the EU side, the thinking always is, okay, if we cooperate with Turkey on this issue, doesn't that interfere with the enlargement process and the non-open negotiating chapters? From the Turkish side, the perception is, well, if they offer us cooperation on these specific issues, is that not membership minus? Yeah? Is that, doesn't that mean they want to give us some kind of consolation prize? So I think uh, there needs to be some fresh thinking in, in terms of seeing cooperation chances without always having the big membership issue uh, in, the, in, the, in the back. Um, so, I, so I think uh, here is... Uh, here is an opportunity yeah, to, ex to, ex to explore cooperation, uh, policy-specific, yeah, where you uh, uh, find uh, common rules uh, to deal with the interdependent issues be between the two sides and uh, hopefully set the membership issue, the enlargement issue, aside for some time. I'm sure it's going to come, come back. Yeah? Things uh, change, things move. But for the, for the moment, it would be really useful yeah, if, if both sides looked at the issues yeah, rather than the big membership issue. Mm -hmm. um, we are always talking on um, EU-Turkey relations, but there are, there are also other um, dimensions. Uh, for example, what about Turkey-NATO uh, relations? 
Mm -hmm. And Tur can Turkey get uh, out of NATO, or is it realistic? No, I, I don't think it's realistic to expect Turkey be getting out of NATO through its own will, and I don't think there are any mechanisms for the other countries to chuck Turkey out of NATO as well. Uh, so I think NATO will remain as is, with the already existing divides within it. So the divide isn't just between Turkey and some other member states of NATO, but also within uh, and across other uh, member, uh, NATO member states as well, like US and some European powers, etc. So uh, yes, NATO is, I think, going through uh, problematic years and period. Also, of course, thanks to the um, Trump administration's position uh, on NATO, and, and which creates question marks as to how committed this administration is to the transatlantic alliance and to the future uh, and a strength in NATO. Uh, but I don't think it will go, you know, you know basically to do along the road where it will lead to uh, NATO's demise and that, uh, that I don't see realistic, again, in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Schimafini, how would you see the... Um um, common, if there is common security and defense policy of the European Union, considering the relations with uh, the US and with Russia, of course. Well, of course, uh, the uh, common security and defense policy has always been the least in integrated policy area of the European Union. And uh, there was not really any strong demand or necessity yeah, to develop that policy dimension further because there was NATO. Yeah? Uh, uh, it would be very hard for the European Union to replicate the capacities of NATO and what NATO could do for their, for their defense. So as long as NATO functions at least half well, uh, there's, there, will be, uh, there will not be much enthusiasm in the European Union to strengthen it, its, its own defense cooperation. And there are many member states, especially those that are closer to Russia, yeah, that would not want to rely on a, a European guarantee as long as the American guarantee looks somewhat stable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, of, of course, I think there, there are some, some developments. Um, uh, there are developments that we see in terms of uh, defense cooperation, not in the, in the hard military terms, but in, in, in terms of economic defense procurement mm -hmm. cooperation. We've seen some moves in that direction, because if you, if you look at... Um, European defense policy, you see a lot of duplication, yeah, and it's, it's highly inefficient yeah, to have so many small member states all uh, having their own little weapon systems, having their own little defense industry. So there is an economic um, uh, driver here. And of course, the rest also depends on what happens out, outside the European Union. Yeah? Uh, first of all, how strong the Russian threat uh, is, is, is being perceived, uh, but I think uh, the more important dimension is what is going to happen in the transatlantic relationship. Yeah? And yeah. Uh, Europe, I mean, if, uh, so far I think there's been, there's been more smoke than fire. Yeah? I think the defense cooperation on the ground works, but let assume another Trump term, assume uh, a, uh, an anti-NATO uh, policy on the uh, US side, uh, then Europe might be forced to do something that it really doesn't want to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, another, another question, um, do you see Russia as a close threat or danger for especially eastern borders of the European Union? Well, I mean, it's, it's a big, big challenge, I think, mm -hmm. of course. I mean, if you have uh, Russia acting as an assertive actor in the wider neighborhood, which mm -hmm. it has been doing for some time now, and plus Russia has the capacity to act as a singular actor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to the European Union, as Frank was saying, does not have a unified European, at least a solid, you know, unified and coherent foreign security and defense policy. It has to rely on NATO and plus, you know, of course, the individual capabilities of the member states. But there, of course, you have different threat perceptions. Uh, the threat perception differs from one EU member state to the other when it concerns Russia. Of course, if you're from a Baltic country, you tend to have naturally, right, more in, uh, intense threat perceptions about Russia and its intentions. Whereas if you're a, you know, southern uh, member state, 
states, uh, you know, drastically the threat perception might might decrease. Uh, so, but but uh, I mean, for me, the Russian threat is somewhere, mm -hmm. or the challenge is somewhere in the middle. You know, not perhaps invading, you know, Estonia tomorrow, mm -hmm. but also not a distant actor that's there just minding its own business. So it's somewhere in the middle. Um, it is an important actor in the sense that not only it's geopolitically uh, very assertive in the eastern neighborhood, but also now in the southern neighborhood, of course, through Syria, through Libya. So it's not just the east that Europe should be concerned about. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it most recently in the Libyan case, for instance, yeah. and the divisions between France and Turkey and Russia, etc. So it's becoming a major issue. And also Russia is an issue concerning the domestic politics of some of the EU member states as well. For instance, you know, there are speculations and claims about how it has uh, played a role, let's say, in the Brexit referendum and other elections and, mm -hmm. you know, funding populists, etc. You know, I mean, I think we still have to be careful to not to over-exaggerate maybe the influence of Russia in European domestic politics, but it's definitely playing a different game there, and I think we need to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are so many questions and issues um, to discuss, but our time is limited and we have another program uh, after this program, so we have to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you and thank you very us. much for watching. Uh, see you next time. <laughs>